for joining. Um, um, again, um, it, it's it's really an honor to um, to be the first speaker in the seminar series, um, and I would have loved to be in person uh, with you in Cambridge. Would uh, would would have been enjoyed that uh, a bit better than um, just staring at the screen. Um, so I wanted to discuss today two topics with you, and um, on the one hand, it's um, applying domain adaptation, and on the other hand, how we can extend deep learning uh, with physics-based approaches, uh, always um, considering the topics of fault um, diagnostics and prognostics. Um, and uh, please feel free to interrupt me if, if there's any question or if, uh, if there's uh, something that is not clear, I think for, since um, it's rather a small group, we can really discuss that. So um, what we're typically looking into is systems um, or, or what we're trying to solve is on the one hand to, uh, to detect faults, um, but then also not just to detect the faults, but also to distinguish which different fault types that may be. Um, and if you look into a rather simple system as a railway wheel, uh, which looks probably a bit simpler than it is, um, and the different fault types may be the flat spot um, that we see here, or it may be the non-roundness that we see there here at the bottom. Um, but then we, we don't only want to, um, to diagnose or to distinguish between the fault types, we would also like to predict how, for example, this non-roundness condition is evolving over time. And this is rather um, the most important information for us because then we can really uh, react to it rather proactively. So um, even if um, these um, wheels may not be you know, very complex, but we're also looking into um, more complex systems such as aviation systems, um, hydropower plants, uh, but also power networks. Um, and these challenges that we're trying to solve on the one hand um, are um, or have their challenges, um, but since there have been, has been more and more data that has been collected on the condition of those systems, um, but also due to the progress of deep learning, um, it appears that those could be potential enablers for us to solve um, this, um, the challenges that we are trying to solve. And if you look into what um, artificial intelligent algorithms have been able to perform today, so what they have been really good in is uh, recognizing objects, uh, but also recognizing emotions. Um, and what has been quite surprising, they are even uh, painting paintings that are sold um, at Christie's, at auctions, and are actually achieving quite high uh, prices. Um, and particularly deep fake has been quite, um, quite famous um, recently. It has been achieving some of the things that have not been considered to be achievable before. Uh, they're trading stocks, but also writing music, and are really getting a bit more creative um, in writing film scripts. Um, but also they can collaborate and compete and decide when does it make sense to collaborate and when does it rather make sense to, to compete. Um, and what these algorithms actually do typically require is um, large representative data sets um, in order to, to train the algorithm and able to enable them to perform tasks that they are supposed to perform. Um, but in many cases, it's not just that they need to have a large representative data set, it's also that they require a label. So they, um, they need to know what there is to learn in a specific um, input or in a specific image, for example. And the things that we are considering um, or that we are most interested in are actually faults. Um, and in our case, faults would be equivalent to labels, <clears throat> since this is really what, what we would be interested in, which would be the fault trajectory or the degradation trajectories. Um, but we would really need to have access to a lot of different fault types and a lot of different degradation trajectories in order to train our algorithms. And faults in critical systems are rather rare, particularly if, we have, if they are safety critical. Um, so it's not possible to um, collect this large amount of representative data. Um, and this is why it's also not possible to learn a good representation of faulty conditions, also given the fact um, that faults are, are rather very diverse. And even if we have collected some samples, we may not be even sure that um, this is, um, will be representative also for faults that will be occurring in the future. 
Um, sorry, um, and, and even what is more, um, if we have a new system, then for sure we will not have sufficient folks to, to train our algorithms on. Um, and then we need to rely on some other things that we, um, uh, we, we are still able to solve the challenges um, that we are dealing with. Um, and what is the, um, uh, an additional challenge that is arising? So even if we were able to collect uh, you know, data sets that are rather representative, uh, what is um, challenging as well is that over time, this, the, uh, the system conditions are actually evolving and changing. Um, and sometimes systems are operated at conditions that they may not even have been designed for. Um, so there's on the one hand that quite a high variability of, um, of operating conditions, but also um, the operating conditions um, and environmental conditions part as well um, are really changing over time. So then we, um, even if we have collected data set, it may not be representative for the entire um, operating profile that is possible for us. So, so just some of the challenges um, that we need to deal with. So on the one hand, we have um, either just use uh, labels or completely missing labels. Um, then we do have a quite high diversity of, um, of system configurations and operating conditions. So in many cases, uh, we, we may have some systems that are similar, um, but typically configurations of those systems may still be um, um, diverse, so then um, none of the systems is actually really um, comparable to each other. So this is um, one additional challenge that is adding to it. Um, and what is uh, required for a lot of um, uh, recommendations that are provided is not just to provide a prediction or recommendation, but also to provide more interpretability since um, and there's quite a lot at stake. And then particularly if engineers are dealing with that, they do require some interpretability for, for the outputs um, that they will be dealing with. Um, and what we, uh, what we need as well in many cases is uh, that we, we, not, we are not only required um, to, um, well, to interpolate in, uh, within the data space that uh, we have collected, um, but um, in many cases, we actually require to, to rather extrapolate, so to generalize um, to things that we haven't seen before. And I wanted to show to you some of the, um, some of the approaches that um, we have been working on in order to tackle some of, the, um, um, of those challenges. Um, and the first one, what, what we actually are interested in um, is that um, we try to transfer models um, between different operating conditions. And in this case, we're actually assuming that faults are available during training, um, but only um, on one operating condition. Um, so since we don't have so many um, faulty samples, and since we don't have uh, large amounts of, um, of um, representative fault conditions, what we could actually do uh, once we have collected data um, on one system of a fleet, we could then try to, um, to use this information to, to use the model to transfer it um, to other systems within a fleet or to other systems within um, uh, or to other operating conditions. So what is often happening though is uh, that even though we may have systems that are um, um, have similar characteristics within a fleet, um, they will be operated typically really quiet in a dissimilar way. And, and even if they all start at the very same healthy condition, um, um, what we will see over time that it really starts diverging um, and um, some of them may fail and some of them um, are still continuing being operated in, in under healthy conditions. Um, so what, what we still have, even though we have access to those um, units in a fleet, uh, we are still facing the challenge uh, that they are not exactly the same. So what we could actually um, do instead is to try to, um, to see um, where such problems um, have been actually encountered um, or similar challenges. Um, and this is what we um, often um, have observed in computer vision applications. Um, so if models are developed on, on system or on very clean images um, and uh, then are applied to images uh, that are rather taken under real conditions, uh, what is often happening that the model um, that is trained on those clean images um, is really dropping in performance 
um, and uh, we will not um, be able to maintain that performance um, under real conditions. Um, so this is where domain adaptation has been really thriving. And um, the goal of domain adaptation is to take those um, um, or to take the, um, the model or the models with the, uh, with the that are experiencing a distribution shift and then to align this uh, distribution in the, in the feature space in order to um, benefit from the, um, from the labels that are only present in the source classifier and then transfer that model or to adapt the model to the conditions um, in the target domain. And what, what is um, for us the domains, um, so on the one hand we can consider domains being different operating conditions or we can consider domains being different units. Um, so we have a domain gap between either two operating conditions or between two different units of a fleet. Um, and in fact, uh, domain adaptation is, um, 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 is a special type of transfer learning. Um, and if you look into the different types of transfer learning, so what we have is um, that on the one hand, um, that we have labeled data um, that is only available on the source domain and um, that we still have the same task that is being solved. So this is where we are in the field of, um, of domain adaptation. Um, and one of the best performing or the um, approaches, but also one of the most widely new, um, used approaches um, have been the so-called um, domain adversarial um, neural networks. Um, and uh, what, what they have been, um, what their, their, um, their basic idea is um, to use uh, um, this, um, the adversarial training part um, in order to align the distributions um, in, in the feature space from the source and from the target domain. Um, so it has actually two parts. And on the one hand, we have the feature generator. Um, and on the other hand, we have the, the domain classifier. Um, so um, this is also why we have two parts of, um, of the loss. So we still have the normal classification loss. Um, in this case, we are considering, for example, um, fold types that we need to classify. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and we add this additional um, domain discrimination loss for so the, um, the loss of the domain classifier. Um, and um, this um, gradient reversal layer has been proposed um, um, some time ago, um, and it has been really uh, enabling to perform um, or to, to jointly optimize um, this, um, these two parts of the loss, um, and it's in um, in max problem. Uh, we also add a, a, a weight parameter here um, for, for our domain classifier. Um, so at the conversion point, what, what we get as a result is uh, that um, in fact the um, features from the source and from the target domain um, become indistinguishable. Um, so then uh, the domain classification losses in this um, case actually uh, maximized, um, and we still have this uh, um, um, the, uh, a low classification loss. So that's the, just the, the basic idea of um, domain adversarial networks. Um, so what we wanted to solve with it um, is to apply it to, um, to a case study of um, fault um, diagnostics. So what we are assuming is that we have a source domain and the source domain and in our case is an operating condition. But on the source domain, we have access to all the different fault types and also the healthy conditions. And we now have uh, a new data set without any labels. Um, however, now um, we have, um, it has been collected under different operating conditions. So now we are experiencing um, a domain shift. Um, and we applied this um, to a case study um, of, um, of bearing full diagnostics. Um, it's a um, data set that was collected under lab um, conditions. So there are 10 different um, classes in total. Um, nine of them are faulty classes and there are three different fault types with three different severity levels. Um, and what we are considering as domains here, um, there are four different loads um, and the data was collected under these different load conditions. Um, so if we train our model just on the source data set and then apply it to the target data set, 
Um, and this is in fact the baseline here. So in this case, it results in a performance of 95%, which is already actually quite high, and which also means that the uh, domain gaps are, are not that big. And, and in fact, it's an average performance um, in all the different directions for the four different loads. Um, and if we apply the domain adversarial neural networks now and align the feature space, um, this results in a performance um, of around 99%. So this is rather um, encouraging for us. However, if you look into what, uh, which setups are we actually assuming now? Um, and what we are assuming that we do have access to all the different fold types um, in the target domain uh, already during the training time. So um, which actually assumes that we need to wait until our, our training, the, um, our, our target domain has already collected all the different fold types. And this is actually rather unrealistic. So we, we, we should actually rather expect that in our, um, in our target data set during training, we may not have experienced different fold types. And this is a classical case of, um, um, of partial domain adaptation. However, what partial domain adaptation normally assumes um, is um, that um, for that we, we can um, expect that um, for the target data set during training, we may have not all the different fold types or classes available. However, then we, we, are, we would be only interested in only those classes when we are testing the algorithm. And this is not a realistic scenario because um, we are still interested in all the different fold types even if they were not um, already observed on the target data set. So this is why rather there is a scenario that we are seeing here on the right side. Um, this is the rather realistic scenario. Um, and this is what we're, um, the challenge that we actually need, um, need to solve. Um, so if we now apply the very same uh, domain adversarial neural networks um, to it, um, even in this scenario, what is actually happening is um, that um, since we don't have all the classes represented um, in the target data set um, during training, um, then it, it really gets misaligned. And this is what we see um, on the right. So this is um, just a simple example on the missed data set and missed other digit data sets. Um, and there were some classes missing during training, so it really gets uh, um, not not uh, not aligned, and that we would not be able to transfer the models between um, those two domains. Um, so what we then propose instead, um, since we we in fact have a good representation um, on our source domain, um, that we should actually keep this representation and rather um, um, fix it, and then to unilaterally align the target um, uh, the target domain distribution to the source domain distribution, um, instead of bilaterally aligning it in, in a common feature space that, that we are only aligning it from, um, from the target to the source and are really fixing the, um, the source representation. Um, and this is um, the resulting architecture. So in the first step, we train the, um, the, um, the feature extractor on, um, just on the source data set. Um, then we fix um, the features here. Um, and then what we add additionally to, to the two parts of the loss that we had before, uh, we add additionally this consistency loss and what the consistency loss does, it penalizes the deviation um, of this, um, of the newly learned features um, from the source features that were actually fixed here. Um, so this is why we have now three parts of the loss. We have the, um, well, the, the, the classifier loss that we still have here. Then we have the domain classification loss also that we had before. And now we have this third part, this, um, this is the consistency loss. And we evaluated first on the MNIST data set and um, the MNIST data set, the MNIST um, to MNIST M data set. So that's um, the, uh, the black and white digits. And now um, on the target, uh, we have this colorful background. Um, and what we then did, we started dropping the classes one by one. And then we were evaluating the different, um, the, the, um, kind of the baseline. Um, this is when, um, when well, if we don't do anything, and then we have, this is the case um, where we were just applying the domain adversarial neural network 
um, and the green line is then when we were applying the, um, um, the unilateral alignment. And what you see that, um, in fact, um, when we start dropping classes um, for the domain and receiver neural networks also perform rather well um, until uh, we then start dropping too many classes at the same time. Um, and um, at the end, it really, um, the model basically collapses and gets really misaligned. Um, however, there, um, the unilateral alignment really keeps this representation. Um, and in this case, it really maintains the performance even if nine of the classes are actually missing um, during the training. So it's just one class that is present. Um, and then we applied this, um, this case to, um, to, um, to, again, the same case study that we were looking into. But now what we're assuming that when we're training the model, we only have access um, on the target data set only to the, to the healthy conditions here. Um, so um, we still have the same um, bearing data set that we looked into. We still have the four different domains. Um, and what we are getting for the baseline performance um, is still the very same because we are still training just on the source data set. Um, but now what we are getting uh, with this unilateral alignment um, and for the case that we only have healthy data during training, which is really quite um, a challenging task because um, it did not see any of the faulty data. Um, and um, what we are getting there is um, still 98% performance, uh, which is 1% uh, below the, the maximum that we were able to get when we're having access to all the different fault types, uh, which is, um, um, so we are decreasing the performance a bit, but still it's 3% um, it's improvement compared to the baseline. Um, and it's, it's quite a, a good performance um, improvement um, as well. So this is um, how it worked when we were still relying on, um, on having access to the, faulty, um, to, to the faulty data on the source data set. So this were the, the two case studies. However, in many cases, um, we may not even have access to the faulty cases on, on the source data set as well. Um, and in this case, what we may be rather interested in is to transfer the operational experience um, between different units. So before we were trying to transfer the faulty conditions, but now we would like to transfer the operational experience. So we are not um, assuming any faults um, during training. Uh, but before I proceed um, with, um, with what we actually did in, in terms of um, domain adaptation or rather um, unsupervised transfer learning there, I wanted to explain the short view how we are actually performing fault detection um, since I will be relying on it um, for this um, for, um, for, for the task later on. Um, so what, what we have been uh, performing um, quite a lot um, when, when our task was to detect the fault um, and when, uh, when we only had access to healthy data during training, uh, what we were typically doing is we were applying an autoencoder to reconstruct our signals. Um, um, and this was just trained on healthy conditions. Um, and then we were taking the, the learned features, um, we were plugging them in into our one class classifier. And what, um, what the one class classifier was actually um, performing for us, so it's not a, a binary classification output, but it's a continuous output that it was providing to us. Um, and we, we defined it as, uh, well, we could interpret it as a kind of health indicator because it measures the distance to the training data once we see um, um, we, we are applying new, um, new data to it. Um, so this is why it could be interpreted as, um, as a health indicator since um, it gets, um, it increases the more um, different it gets to the training data. So the more unhealthy it gets, um, the higher it actually increases. Um, and um, and um, um, so we, we calibrated um, or we calibrate the threshold to be at one for the for our training data, and then we start measuring after um, after we stop training, and then we start monitoring it. And what we have actually seen um, for several applications um, that um, on the one hand it starts deviating quite a lot uh, when we see uh, faulty operating conditions. Um, uh, but also what we could see is that we could um, um, observe um, differences um, in the severity of the fault 
um, and partly it was really following um, the real um, degradation trajectory. Um, and the second part that we were actually using here, since we have here the reconstructed signals, uh, we could actually use the residuals of the reconstructed signal and interpret them as the fault patterns of our fault, since those signals that would be the most impacted would be deviating. So we could actually um, look into the residuals of the reconstructed signals and could then um, start interpreting them in terms of um, unsupervised fault diagnostics. Um, and again, we were calibrating um, those um, residuals um, and, and we were then detecting those and um, uh, identifying those signals that were um, above the threshold um, and could then present them to the domain experts in order to interpret them. Um, and it's just a, um, a small example. We applied it to um, uh, a generator to, the det um, to detect a fault of a generator. Um, it had around 300 um, sensors that were applied to it, um, and we applied this approach to it, and what we actually saw was um, that when we started monitoring it, um, the health condition really started deviating after a while, and what we could uh, even distinguish was these two um, different severity levels um, in, in the fault, um, and we could detect it um, around 100 days before the fault was actually happening. So it really provides us a nice opportunity to, um, to monitor the, the health conditions. Um, so this was just for one generator, yeah? So I have a question. So yeah. what is the model architecture in that case? Um, Sorry? What is, okay, can you... what, what is the autoencoder uh, architecture? Is it like multi-layer perceptrons or like did you use LSTMs or convolution networks? Um, so, so for this one, we tested different um, architectures, but what you see here was just um, uh, a single layer um, feed forward network was, uh, was quite... Um, and so, yeah. so you mean the encoder and the decoder are both single layer? And uh, because they're the autoencoder. Um, well, uh, no, it's actually because we, um, okay, well, be, because here we're just reconciled, this is our output, so it's just, um, sorry for that, um, so this is our single layer, and this is our output, so it's just uh, a, um, a single layer. Uh-huh, I see. I have a oh, okay. qu question about this architecture as well. Oh, what, yeah. Is there a loss associated with the one class classifier? So, so, sorry, I can. Um... Is there is there a loss associated with the one class classifier? Like where where is the loss function? Right? I'm so sorry. I, I could probably not um, display it. Uh, just, just a second. Um, so the loss. Um, okay, I, I need to explain it then in a bit better way. Um, so what, what we actually did for this uh, one class classifier, we put a target, um, we put um, um, one as target, and then we were basically measuring, um, our loss was measuring the distance uh, to one. I see. Okay. Okay. But, um, so, so this one is, is arbitrary, we can set any number there. Right. And, and just following up, are the features only learned based on reconstruction error? Yes, yes. Got it. Okay, interesting. Okay. So you um, we evaluate them um, for some other, or later on, uh, we, we, uh, we evaluated triplet loss as well. Um, and for, uh, for then we did not reconstruct, but then we evaluated triplet loss. Then uh, what, it, what it was enabling us to do is um, to have a better. Um, a better representation of, of the clusters, um, but but in this case, um, it, um, it was not allowable. So you use the health you, during training. You only have the health, the data, right? Yes. And then, and, and in fact, um, um, so in this case, we did have a confirmation from the project partner. Um, that in this specific um, time period, um, so at the beginning it was healthy and then it was an inspection that was performed. So then we could consider this time period um, to be under healthy conditions. Um, and, um, but for later um, the, uh, evaluations that we did, we did not have this, um, as, or we could not use this assumption. So what we, there, what we were then doing, we split the data set into several chunks. 
Um, and then we were first training on, on one of the chunks and then we're evaluating and then also vice versa. And once um, both have been detected as being healthy, then we were enlarging the training data set and, and this is how we could proceed if we did not have this confirmation that it was um, um, a healthy period. So what is the uh, similarity index? Um, so, so the similarity index, um, um, so we, we actually normalize it. So we train it first um, on the, or we train it on the training data set. And, and then we, um, we apply it to the validation data set. And then um, uh, we, we, um, we normalize it to be, um, to be one. And then, um, then it's, it gets a bit better interpretable. So basically um, the, the exact numbers um, cannot be interpreted directly, um, but they can put um, they can be interpreted in a related way. So um, if that one is a higher value, then we can assume that it's more unhealthy or has, has a larger distance to the health data. Um, but we cannot use the numbers um, as a representation of the health condition. Um, but, but we basically normal or normalize it to be um, um, or to be at, at, at one after we train. Uh, after we apply the validation data set. I see, thank you. I actually did not, this was just a side uh, explanation. Actually, it's it's super interesting. That's why you're getting some good questions. And I, I had one more, <laughs> um, which was, you mentioned looking at the reconstruction error yeah. after, you know, um, um, after you d detected that it there's an anomaly. Yeah. And and um, I was curious, uh, you, you said there might be patterns in there that that an expert. Would... Yeah. yeah. Um, so, sorry, I left out this part. <laughs> yes. Um, or I, I don't have it in the in the in the slides. But um, in fact, what um, in this case, um, so we did look then. So we have this 320 signals. Yeah. Um, and then we looked into those that had the highest deviations or had the highest residuals. Um, and then we selected, um, I believe it was five signals out of this 320, and then we presented them to the domain expert. And for the domain expert, it was actually sufficient just to see um, one of the um, signals um, that was deviating in order to tell what was the, um, the, the, the fault that, um, that initiated the, um, this condition. Um, so um, this was rather encouraging for us. Um, you have to, um, that, that on the one hand, um, he, the, the expert did not have to look into all of the 300 signals right. to find which was the, um, the most deviating ones. Um, and also what, what we did um, in the study for, so from this 320 signals, uh, we then kind of retrospectively assumed that we would know what this fault, uh, which are the, the, the initiating signals um, for this fault. And then we just train the method um, on just on this selected uh, features or, or signals, um, and we, we basically got the same um, performance when we reduced the, um, the number of signals that uh, we, we used to train the model. Um, but this was very specific for that fault type, um, and this is something. So since we don't know which fault type will be happening, it is it is sufficient for that fault type to train the model just on this um, very kind of limited number of signals. Um, but it will not be sufficient for a different fault types. So this is also what, what we wanted to test. Um, so it was performing well, um, but only for that fault type. Great, thank you, thank you. But thanks a lot for, for the questions. Um, so this was kind of the, um, the, the starting point um, and it was still the same uh, industrial project partner and what they then gave to us was now, um, so it was a generator was a bit uh, larger a number of, of signals. It was actually applied in the nuclear power plant. And this is why they had so many signals, um, sensors installed in it. Um, but now it was a different case study and it was 112 gas turbines. Um, and it was um, 12 of us. So we knew that 12 of the gas turbines would have a fault. And we had for each of them, we had one year of data um, that was collected at five minute sampling rates, which was um, snapshots that were taking every um, five minutes. Um, and uh, it was 24 variables in total that were overlapping between the different gas turbines. And actually they were installed in different parts of the world. 
and we did not even know where, where exactly, but um, you could see that from partly from the patterns, how they were operating. Um, so then we thought, well, we have a nice method that works well, we could do something very similar. And, and our, our task was, uh, when would be the first possible point in time that we would be able to detect the faults? Um, so we trained, so um, we cannot take the entire one year of data because then we would not detect anything. So we need to take a decision which part of the data we can actually use to train the models. Um, so we, um, we started with one month and then obviously what you see when you start um, applying it, um, then it starts, so the, um, the blue part is when we start um, applying it. Um, and then it starts deviating actually quite, uh, quite early on and uh, nearly immediately after we started monitoring. But also what you see is um, that it did not observe the winter conditions here. Um, and this has been one of the disadvantages of the approach um, because it basically measures the distance to the training data. And now the training, um, now the data is, uh, becomes dissimilar, but not dissimilar because of the fault, but dissimilar because it has not seen those operating conditions. So then if we extend the observation period to nine months, um, then we, we really can start um, detecting something when, when something's happening. But if we were, if there was a fault at the very, in, in the middle of this nine months, we would have learned the fault. And the question is how long is really sufficient for us? And this is particularly a question if we have a new unit, how long do we really have to wait until we have collected sufficient data? Is it nine months, is it one year? And I was sure after one year that we have collected um, all the different um, um, operating conditions. Um, so this is where, where we actually thought, well, that we have the whole fleet of this 112 gas turbines. And what we could actually do is um, we could rely on this um, operational experience that the other units did. And we could actually transfer this operational experience between the units um, because these winter conditions that that unit hasn't seen, other units will have seen before. Um, so this is why we, we could start um, transferring this and this is for, um, um, the same cases for, for wind turbines. If some of the wind turbines haven't seen um, some of the load conditions, then it's much easier um, and we can transfer from those um, from the fleet. Um, so um, we still have this domain gap that we, um, that we are facing, but now the challenge is that we don't have classes anymore, but we have um, just healthy conditions and, and it's quite difficult to align uh, or, or to know where actually to align to. Um, so, um, and, and what we're actually um, aiming to do is to expand our operational experience, but to expand it in a way that we are not um, taking some faulty conditions and um, or, or taking conditions that would be rather um, not normal for that um, um, term or for that um, gas turbine. Um, and, and by that, uh, we would be preventing the models from detecting. Um, so that's the setup that we are dealing with. So we have a, an experienced source unit on both of them. We just have healthy conditions. Um, but now um, for the target unit, we would really like to expand this operation experience. Um, and if you look again into this transfer learning, um, um, uh, different, ty or different types of transfer learning, now we don't have labels on the source data set anymore. This is why we are in fact in the setup of unsupervised transfer learning, uh, which is um, even a more difficult task than we had before for the domain and application. Um, so this is the architecture that we applied. As you remember, uh, we're actually interested in this one class classification. And um, since we, we cannot um, back propagate there anything, um, that's the challenge. We still have the domain discriminator that we were using before for this um, for the fault classification task. Um, so we needed to come up with an idea of what we could actually use to regularize and, and to, to guide um, this domain alignment. Um, and what, what we then propose to do is um, to use the so-called multidimensional scaling laws, which, is, which was actually also applied uh, for cases um, or for, for dimensionality reduction. And what it basically does is um, it preserves the, um, the distance between the input, um, 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 between the observations in the input space and the observations in this projected space. Um, so we, we can rotate them, we can, uh, we can contract or stretch them, but um, um, the relationship should be preserved. And this is uh, what this loss is actually um, telling here. 
Um, and by doing that, we were then able to sort of now we have the two parts. We have this uh, multi-dimensional scaling laws that we impose, and then we still have this domain discriminator uh, with the gradient reversal layer that we could apply. Um, so then we uh, we can still follow a similar um, recipe that we were actually doing before. Um, so that's the resulting architecture. Um, and this is what we're actually aiming for. Um, and when we applied it to, to this case study of 112 gas turbines, um, this is what we were having before. Um, it's a bit different unit. Um, and um, here we use two months of data. And then again, it did not observe any, um, any winter conditions here. Um, but now um, when we add the operational experience that is adjusted to that operational experience of that specific unit, we now really start only detecting faults when, well, when they were happening. Um, and um, if you remember, we had um, 12 different, um, 12 units that were not failing, uh, that were failing actually. Um, and in fact, one of those units was uh, quite dissimilar to all the others. Um, so uh, in the first step, we were rather trying to find units that were the most similar to it. Um, and it was really um, um, impossible to find it. Um, so only after we started applying this domain adaptation between two different units, um, this is when we started getting um, kind of, um, also detection results and, um, and, and we're not um, adding data that was not um, typical for that specific unit. Any questions here? <laughs> yeah, th there was one uh, um, in the title, just in the previous slide, yeah. above the right plot, it mentions experience from the fleet. This example, was that just learning from one yeah. turbine and transferring to another turbine or yeah. or have you also worked on a way to aggregate across multiple mm -hmm. turbines that's a, that's an excellent question um so in fact it was always um, bilateral so we uh, we evaluated kind of all the turbines for that one turbine but it was always a bilateral transfer um, and in fact, in one of um, the, the upcoming project that uh, uh, will hopefully start soon, um, this will be really the task, uh, not, not just relying on one um, unit, but really benefiting from, uh, from, from the entire fleet and kind of trying to, to pick the pieces that would be the most relevant for that, um, for, for that unit and not just, from, um, for, uh, not just from this bilateral transfer. Right. Interesting. Thank you. Thanks for, for the question. Um, so this is what, what I was um, showing to you so far. So we had this um, experience from one um, transferring one um, for, between different operating conditions, but also transferring um, from well, um, bilateral transfer between different units of the fleet. Um, what we also did um, and for domain adaptation also helped uh, what I didn't show here uh, was when uh, when we tried to um, to adjust um, um, data that we collected from simulations and then to adjust them to real applications and closing this domain um, this domain gap between simulations and real observations. So this is also where um, domain adaptation can be quite quite helpful. I actually have one more topic. I don't have that much time. Uh, uh, do you want me still to, to start with it? Um, or, we have, or do you have a lot of questions on, on the first part and we can start with the discussion? What's, what's your preference? Um, I think you can go, go over this part fairly quickly. I don't know how many slides did you have? It's actually quite a lot because it's a, oh, it's really? kind of a different topic. <laughs> But, but yeah, I, I can just stop whenever whenever we're finished. So, uh, um, maybe just give us the introduction or like some sure, sure. summary. So the second topic that I wanted to to um, to discuss with you um, is uh, how we can actually um, add additional information from physics based models um, to deep learning. Um, um, so basically, combining the best of the two worlds. And there have been different um, uh, um, different approaches, what to do and where we actually are. So um, we can, on the one hand, have a lot of data and then not know a lot about physics. On the other hand, we may not have that much data, but then we may have access to a lot of physics-based models, and we may have, we may be somewhere in between. 
Um, so uh, what I will be showing to you is uh, where, where we have uh, some data and that we also have models, but we, what we don't have is um, we may not have sufficient labels. Um, so what, uh, what we particularly looked into uh, when we have this physics-based models, the different, um, different physics-based models for us, if you wanted to predict the remaining useful life. And on the one hand, we could model the degradation mechanisms, um, but on the other hand, we can model um, the performance. And while we are modeling the performance, um, we can also assess the impacts of faults on the performance. So it's rather an indirect way to modeling it. And we're not modeling the degradation mechanisms directly, but we are sensing it indirectly. So that's kind of the part that uh, we, we looked into. Um, and this is the framework that, um, that, that we propose. On the one hand, we are assuming that uh, we have uh, access to the physics-based models. Um, and we have um, observations from the, um, from the real processes. Uh, we are then calibrating the physics-based models. Um, and from those calibrated um, uh, models, we, we are taking, uh, we are basically enhancing the input space. Um, so uh, we are taking on top of the observations that we have, we are adding to those observations, um, additional the virtual sensors um, so the virtual sensors are those that are actually not observed and are not measured directly. Um, and uh, what, uh, what we are adding on top is this calibration parameters um, that are used to adjust um, our, um, our model to, to the real observations. Um, and they have been quite informative of the health conditions um, of, um, of the systems. And we applied it on the one hand to prognostics task and on the other hand to, to diagnostics task as well. Um, and the system that we were looking into uh, were turbofan engines. Um, so the task is really to predict now the remaining useful life um, and basically to follow this, um, this health index. And now we are not uh, just monitoring it, but we would really like to predict what's the remaining useful life. Um, and um, yeah, as mentioned, we used uh, the, the turbofan engines, um, we used the um, simulator that was developed by NASA, um, and there's quite a, um, a broadly used data set, um, so-called CMAPS data set. However, um, we actually um, took the simulator that generated the data and um, we, uh, we made it a bit more realistic that we were using um, data from, uh, from, from the real flight conditions, and we're also imposing a bit more, um, um, a more realistic degradation trajectory. Um, so in total, there were data from uh, 90 um, turbofan engines that, um, that we generated. However, in the data set that we looked into a bit closer, um, it was a, a bit smaller data set. So we have nine units in total, um, uh, and six engines we, we use for training and three engines we use to test them. And this is just one of the trajectories. Um, so we have the climb, the cruise, and the descent phase. Um, and then we, um, the units were actually flown until they were reaching the, um, um, the end of life. And then uh, we had the, um, the, uh, the um, run to failure trajectories. And there were two different failure moves that we were considering. One hand, the HPT degradation, and on the other hand, the HPT and the um, ALPT flow and efficiency degradation. And if you look into the different units, so these are all the nine units um, that we looked into. Um, so some of them are rather dissimilar to, to the others. So they were rather performing just for um, short flights. Um, and, um, so, and this was the unit that is actually part of the testing data set. And also unit 15, uh, which is also part of the testing data set, is also rather dissimilar to, to the others. Um, so it's, um, it was also to see how, how well gen um, the models were generalized. Um, so that's the, the framework. Um, as already mentioned, uh, we were calibrating the models and then we were using the calibrated signals as input to our models in this case. Uh, we were um, um, evaluating different um, approaches. This was a, um, a CNN actually um, that you see here, but we compared different that I will show you to it, um, the results just in a second. 
Um, so then we compared the data-driven and the hybrid approaches. Um, so this is a normal feed-forward neural network without any um, time or without any historical information as input, um, just the observations at that point in time. Um, and what you see is the shadow area. So these are the predictions during an entire flight envelope. So it's not the uncertainty, it's really the predictions during the, um, the flight envelope. Um, so um, the hybrid approaches um, do perform um, quite better compared to um, if, um, if you take additional um, or if you expand the input space. Um, if you look into the CNN, um, the performance from the, from the data-driven um, already improves quite a lot, but then for the hybrid, it still improves compared to the, to the purely data-driven CNN. And here there um, the quantified results. Uh, so this is um, the feed-forward neural network. We used two metrics um, because this was also how um, NASA was evaluated this, so this is the scoring function um, that is penalizing um, over prediction more than under prediction because then it would be failing too early um, and would not be able to mitigate it. Uh, so the CNNs uh, were performing better compared to the feed forward neural networks. We also compared um, the LSTM performance. It was at the same level um, as CNNs, um, but then we, uh, we continue just with the CNNs for the further evaluations. Um, so this is just the, um, the quantification. Um, so when do the models converge to this five cycle um, um, well, confidence bound basically and don't leave this bound anymore. Um, so this is where uh, when the decision makers could be certain then um, that this is when, when, the, when it will really fail, uh, when the end of life will be reached. Um, and um, for some of the units, uh, we could improve it by around 200% and um, unit 15, it was just 50%, but on average it was 127%. What we then also wanted to evaluate what happens um, if we reduce the training data size. Um, so we have the six units that we train the model on. Um, then uh, we just took the um, uh, three unit or, or the, um, training data for three units and then train our model on the three units uh, and applied it still to this very same uh, three testing units. Uh, what you see that um, in fact, the performance um, of the data driven did decrease um, quite a lot. Uh, when we reduced this training data size, um, but for the hybrid approaches, it was actually staying at the um, at about the very same level. Um, so that was uh, the introduction for, um, for for the prognostics. I actually have one more when they applied it to diagnostics, um, the very same approach, but the task is a bit different. Uh, but in fact, uh, you know, the the, the um, performance improvement. Um, is, is much better for, for the prognostics. What, what we really see um, is that um, on the one hand, we do have this improved performance. We could uh, reduce the training data size, um, could improve the generalization ability since the testing units were really performing quite similarly. Um, but we could also um, show that um, it could be actually applied to transfer the models uh, within the fleet without applying those domain adaptation approaches. Um, and since we have the physics-based model um, that is actually running in parallel to, um, to, to the deep learning models, we could really improve the interpretability because we can always pinpoint what, what is going on um, in, in the simulator. Um, and I guess that's, uh, that, that's it. Um, thank you very much for, for your time. I'm, I, I still uh, have time to answer some questions if you have any. Yeah, I have one. But where did where did you, did you get the NASA data, or is it public, or is it? Uh, yes, indeed, we, we did upload it actually. So it's uh, NASA has a repository. I will be happy to to share the link. So if you go, I think it's uh, uh, NASA performance performance repository or something like that. So we did upload the data there, so it's openly available. So, um, the simulator is not openly available, but the data is openly available. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Any, any further questions? So how, in your case, is all time series the same length or um, how do you deal with cases where there are different lengths of uh, time series? So it, it's not the same length actually because uh, they're, um, well, they're, they're failing at different points in time. 
um, but since we're applying a convolutional neural network, so then we are sliding actually over over the time series. So yours, I mean, like for the encoder, auto encoder, you're sliding over. No, uh, we, we are not applying now an autoencoder. So this is um, um, because now we have the um, remaining useful life as our target. And, and the remaining useful life. So now uh, we have, or we, uh, we, we assuming that we have access um, to when, the, when is the point of time when the unit will be failing. Um, and basically the, the target is um, then um, a linear um, trajectory between the point in time when uh, when it's failing and at the point in time that the QR. Oh, okay, so I, I get it in this case. How about in the previous cases of like uh, fault detection? If is all time series the same length or? Um, so again, this is not the same length. So for the case for the gas turbines, um, and we were not using the time series as input, we were just using the, um, the, the slice at that specific point in time. So for example, for the, for the generated case, we were using just the observations at that point in time. So this 320 uh, um, measurements at that point in time, that was, uh, it, so it was just a feed forward without any um, but without taking any previous time steps into consideration. I see, thank you. But, um, so for, for some others, uh, we were um, also applying autoencoders, um, also autoencoder LSTM um, for, for time series data as well. Yes, uh, we did do that. I did not present it here. Great. Do anyone have more questions? Um, so thank you, Professor Dr. Oglafink, for presenting. It's a very interesting, and, uh, very complete overview of your um, research. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. It's, it's not. It, it, it was just some of the pieces, actually. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> It, it was not um, <laughs> well, we, we we do. things as well but, um, but th thank you very much for, for the interesting questions it was, um, thank you thank you and now we know where to look for more yeah <laughs> because um, as, as you know um, um, our lab is doing similar stuff although just lost. oh really yeah. okay. oh, there you go sorry um, so I mean as, as you know my our lab is doing similar stuff so um, I, we, we learned a lot from your presentation. And, Absolutely. Yeah. So this is me, Bankinson, and this is my supervisor. Hi, I'm Dwayne, Dwayne Bonning. <laughs> Thank you again. Nice to meet you. Great, great talk. Look forward to talking with you uh, again in the future, I think. Yeah, we, we have actually started working on, on graph neural networks, for example, detecting uh, leakage in, in pipe networks. And, uh, so, so there are some things that are would be rather new. Uh, I would be happy to share our new results, but uh, um, I would be also happy to learn uh, from, from, from your, about your research as well. Uh, was, was, it was a pleasure. Great, yeah. Uh, again, look forward to future conversations, and thanks again. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Thank you. Have a good afternoon then. And thanks for spending lunch time with me. Yeah, <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Have a nice day. Bye bye. bye, -bye.